so for those who may not know me or may have forgotten about me after the long break, I'm still called Leon Stifumana. I'm the chair of the Economics Department. It's my pleasure to, my pleasure to welcome you all uh, to this fourth annual Sambors lecture at uh, the University of Massachusetts Department of Economics. Um, so in addition to support from the department, the Sam Bowles Lecture is made possible in part by a generous anonymous donation. I would like to thank Sheila Gilroy, Director of Association and Research in the Economics Department, and Nicole Dunham, I don't know if she's around, the Perry uh, Director of Administration for organizing and hosting the event. Thanks to Adam for all the technical um, support. Um, I thank also Deepanka, who has helped in facilitating the contact with Professor Baduri and for helping with the logistics and getting him here. Thanks. Um, I invite all of you all to a reception in the Golden Hall atrium down one floor following the lecture. There will be lots of goodies. So the purpose of the Samples lecture is to highlight the work by faculty and graduate students of the economics department. The lecture series was established to honor the work of our colleague Sam Bowles and the work of people who worked in his tradition. One of the founding members of what is now known and recognized as the premier heterodox department in the world outside the universe. The department is proud of what Sam and, and his colleagues have been able to accomplish while he was here as a full-time staff member, staff or faculty member, in that part, other parts of the world they say staff, uh, as well as how he continues to be a shining star in the profession and an excellent ambassador to the, for the department. The fourth sample lecture today is given by Professor Amit Baduri, an emeritus professor of economics at Jawaharlal uh, Nehru University of JNU. Delhi, India, and who has also held teaching positions and research positions at uh, other places among, among others, the Delhi School of Economics, the uh, JNU, Stanford, uh, and studied at, at Presidency College, Calcutta, MIT, and Cambridge University, where he received his PhD in 1967. Through his research and writing, Amit Baduri has made and continues to make important contributions to several areas in economics, including development economics, heterodox macro, the study of agrarian economies in the developing world, the integration of modern finance into macro modeling, and political economy of development in contemporary India. There are three, stand, three strands of his work which are worth highlighting for his long-standing contribution to the economics profession. First, his work in the late uh, 60s on the dynamics of agrarian economies was extremely influential in the famous mode, uh, the famous mode of production debate in India in the 70s and 80s. It continues to inspire researchers working on the economies, the economic structure of backwardness. His work uh, with uh, Steve Marlin in, in the late 80s on wage-led and profit-led growth has become one of the most influential contributions to contemporary uh, heterodox macro. It will be recognized by all students of heterodox macro in the form of the Baduri Margarine Investment Function. In recent years, his writings on the Indian growth process and its political and economic dimensions has been extremely influential in progressive circles in India. His, work, his body of work has become an important source of mat material for, uh, for the late activists in India. But Duri has published more than 60 papers, I didn't want to think about it because I would spend two hours reading it, in the international peer review uh, journals. He has written six books, I just mentioned two of them, On the Border of Economic Theory and, his and History, published in 1999, and Development with Dignity, published in 2006. Some of his books and articles have been, have been translated in several European and Asian languages. He has been a fellow of various institutes of advanced studies in Austria, Sweden, Germany, and India, and he has worked on various expert bodies at the United Nations and served as a member of, 
of some national uh, and international commissions. In recognition for his pioneering contributions, Professor Baduriwa awarded the 2016 Leontief Prize for advancing the frontiers of economic thought by the Global Development and Environment Institute of Africa. Today, Professor Baduri will deliver the fourth annual Sandbox lecture with a talk on financial growth. Oh, okay. Suggestive model finance, financial growth and debt collapse and a little variation. Uh, so, Professor Baduri, uh, welcome to, uh, to Amherst and thanks for taking time uh, to talk to us about your, your, your research. Uh, and members and friends of the economics department, please join me in welcoming Professor Baduri. Well, thank you very much for a very generous introduction and for having me here. It is, I have of course heard about the growing reputation of this place, UMass Amherst, as a, you know, sort of out of the way, or what is called a heterodox school, and probably the, now probably the most recognized one in certainly in the United States and probably in the world. The, it is certainly one of the re leading ones anywhere. And this is my first visit here and therefore I'm doubly honored and it is a pleasure. But with this I must start by saying that all over generous introduction like the one which you give has one problem because, and that problem is very simple. The lecture always is a come down <laughs> after the generous introduction. So be prepared for it. <laughs> now, let me start, since we do not have too much time and I want to go through. I, I, before I came to give that lecture, I was thinking how exactly to, in a title, to capture what I'm going to talk about. I first thought I would call this lecture a <coughs> forecasting, forecasting financial disaster. Then when I thought about it, what actually the lecture talks about, it seemed to me it is an exaggeration in terms of precisely what I'm going to say and the kind of formal conditions which I will hint at at the end. So I rejected that. Then I thought I'll call it simply a model of, a model of, you know, financial growth and crisis. Very much in the tradition of, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, what used to be what was called the endogenous models of business cycles. It started with Kaletsky, Six, Hicks and Samuelson, Caldor, and it went on to all the endogenous models. But when you think of those models, one of the very important things in the models is you had a national income accounting at the background, the double entry format. Those of you who remember the, or have remembered the original Kaletsky paper, which was published before Keynes, which both anticipated the double entry national income accounting and it also had the so-called Kaletsky profit equation, which is basically the saving investment equation. <coughs> but when I thought of introducing finance, modern finance, I will come to it by what I mean by it. When I thought of introducing modern finance in a manageable macro model, and I looked around, I mean, I'm not a great scholar and I don't read too much of the literature, but when I, partly because, well, anyway, I did not really find a sufficiently tight formal reasoning which will introduce modern finance clearly. I mean, Minsky is very suggestive. Keynes chapter 12 is extremely suggestive. 
the Tobin's portfolio choice introducing in that way is also suggestive. They will all come at a certain point. But none of them, I, I believe, none of them actually capture what modern finance is all about and what we are seeing around us. If we want to understand modern capitalism, I think we have to repose the problem in a way which satisfies two conditions. It should be a simple standard macro model, not a very elaborate, you know, model which can be simulated and so on and so forth, but something which give the basic message very clearly. This is the first reason and I do not think such a model exists. And the second reason for this is at the same time it should be sufficiently tight. It should, you know, I mean I don't mean only algebra, I mean it should be sufficiently tight in terms of exactly what you are saying. And I think this is where sort of people like Minsky were suggestive but not really Many of the things you don't, you see, but you don't capture, you know, you don't, it does not stay with you sufficiently. And Tobin's portfolio choice about which I'll have something to say, is too much of a, you know, never, never land of perfect competition model when it, you, you strip it to its essential to really capture the uh, modern aspects. So let me see whether to some extent we can overlook these problems. The paper is, I have worked with some younger colleagues, one of them Raghavendra is present here who also helped and so on. But it is very much a work in progress and you will see something which is or is not coming out of this. As I said, if you think of business cycle models, and they had a national income, income accounting at the back of it. We have to have a similar national income accounting with modern finance to do the, to start a macro model, to make sure. So I start with something which is very well known, but before that, this requires the first element of theoretical departure, innovation, whatever it is. You see, and this, at least to my mind, and to some of you maybe of people of my or near about my generation, what used to be called the capital theory controversy between the Cambridge and Cambridge, Cambridge MIT and Cambridge England, and to some extent. To, in a simple-minded way, people think that it was about the production function and it was about measuring capital and so on. It is not. It was not. It was about something quite different. It was not about double switching. I mean, all these are nice things to debate in universities and so on. But it was really getting across a major point. And I think it came out most clearly. Uh, one of the few times, a couple of times, which I have talked to Piero Safa, I think I owe this to him, that one of the things which the capital theory controversy was trying to get at, I mean, on the surface, it was against marginal productivity. But actually, what it was trying to get at was something else. It was trying to say, and the point goes back to Wixell, not to Straffer. It, it was trying to say that capital has two functions in any capitalist economy. One function is production as means of production, how you value it and so on is a much minor problem. One is a means of production, which typically you want to capture in production function. And the other element of capital is its purpose for distribution. Now, the first departure is that as in the traditional debate of the 1960s and so on, it was basically capital, it was the one purpose of capital or in Wigsell, it was capital and its distribution between profit and wage, between capitalists and workers and this is the mode in which it is usually done all along. In modern capitalism, which is a property owning democracy, a term of John Robinson's, who was very fond of using, 
in a proper tuning democracy where, where actually much of the profit, well, part of the profit at least is distributed and so on, it is also one function of the capital, capital market valuation is the distribution of profits among property owners, those who own shares and so on and so forth. So this is one element which I want to introduce in the model, rather than the profit wage distribution. And if we have time, we'll show it. There is a way in which you can link personal distribution of income, what is called personal distribution of income, with class distribution of income, that is between capitalists and work workers, in a not very complicated way, at least roughly you can do something, there are one or two papers on this, but leave that as a minor problem at the moment. So what you basically have is I have, I start, I want to set up a model which has two measures of capital. I mean with this notion of capital, as a, what I said, capital theory controversy and so on at the background, there is one measure of capital which is the firm's own as produced means of production. And there is another measure of capital, which I will call wealth, which is the same things when valued by the capital market and is put on the stock market or, you know, as evaluated by the capital market for distribution of profit. This gives me my very first equation. working. Oh, this one? Oh, okay. Okay. That is the first equation. W is the wealth. K is the book value of capital as done by the accountants of a firm. The details, as I said, we want to set up a model which actually captures in a essentially simple way some of the main points I want and the ratio between the two, it is a stock to stock ratio. Remember the wealth as evaluated by the capital and K is the, as by the accountants of the firm, the means of production and the ratio between the two gives you that ratio V, which I will call the value of a share for obvious reasons because it is that. Now, wh what is the picture? The picture is in the modern capitalism, very roughly speaking, what is the picture? The picture is uh, the mental picture. The mental picture is very simple. You have, say, a set of firms producing different goods, some corporate, some small startups, whatever it is, some students taking loans, and you have various kinds of income streams and debt streams coming out of this. How the capital is financed, on which people like Minsky spent a lot of time, but you have various, you know, CDOs, collateralized debt obligations. You have also asset-based, you know, collaterals. You have various names of this sort. But this gives you basically a whole stream of, based on this, the financial sector produces financial products. I'll just call them just like physical products, they produce financial products. And this gives you another measure of capital. That is how they will distribute the profit depending on who owns what part of those claims. We can come back to this in more detail later. I mean, just to give you a throwaway piece of statistics, just now, right now, that is in the last month or so on, according to the IMF data, the value of capital owned by the firms, approximately speaking, to leverage to the leveraged is about seven in the United States. Europe, six. Developing countries, the more successful, successful in the sense, high growth, going capitalist at a faster rate, those countries of Asia, about four. So this is roughly what is called leverage and so on. It is something like this. The second point about equation one, which many people have pointed out to me, immediately it should strike you that it is very similar to Tobin's 
Q. It is very similar to Keynes' general theory, I think page 152 to 156 and so on, chapter 12, where he talks about it is the choice of make versus buy of the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur can either acquire a firm or the entrepreneur can actually replace the value of capital, as Tobin would say. Either you can make it or you can buy it. Tobin called it Q. Minsky called it the two price theory of investment. But the difference between all those and this is simply that the, this is a ratio of the stock and we'll see its importance later. Though it looks very similar, it's a ratio of the two stocks and therefore it involves not only the new finance, the entrepreneur's choice of investment, but it's also the old one that is all the stocks which get revalued continuously by the capital market. All the, all the shares which get in revalued, and it is not only the new shares. Okay. Then on the basis of this, equation two sets up a saving investment equality. In the simplest case, where all, all savings come out of profits, because I really, the reason is I want to discuss the distribution of profits. The model has to be as simple as possible. Distribution of profits. And this has two elements. P is the profit of the real sector. You know, the profit which is made by the, the which goes to the real sector. And pi is the profit which goes to the ownership of wealth. Because some of the profits, you call it retained profit or whatever it is, is retained by the firms. The full national income accounting, uh, the stock flow accounting, a la Godly and so on, is not done. Partly because I have not yet reached the stage where I am very clear how to do it. Maybe there are some mistakes. But more likely that I don't want to get cluttered up in unnecessary this kind of accounting for understanding the basic mechanism. So you have the profits of the real sector and you have the profits of the financial sector. Now, I take out, just to make the equation simple, it has some implications, but I would not go into this. I take out, I is the real sector's investment, expenditure on the real sector. B is the expenditure on the core banking sector. And F is the expenditure on the you know, what nowadays is called shadow banking or the sector which is not really the core, which is more closely supervised by the central bank and so on, that sector. Now, if you look at it, the expenditure, from the expenditure side, what does it mean? Again, the physical picture. I basically means that certain machines or means of production are being made, working capital, fixed capital and so on but then the expenditure on them by rest of the by, by the economy on it b is the loan of the firms which the firms give out which is taken and the expenditure on this is all the repayment which is made by those who have borrowed the money f is the financial products which are made based on typically i had in mind securitization that the securitized, the loans are securitized, made up and done in various ways. And those financial products, the new financial products, which are the expenditure on them. So you have this total. This is the expenditure side, and that is the profit generated, which must equal to make saving investment equality, the so-called Kalecki profit equation, Keynes saving investment equality. I take out, the, to simplify the equations, I take out B so that oh, from now on, from equation three, it is net of interest payment to firms. You can complicate it, you can make uh, various things about how to show the relation between investment banks and commercial banks and so on, but leave that all out. I take out the interest payments and I have a basic equation, expenditure on real sector, Equation three, plus expenditure on the financial sector, these two equals the profits which goes to the two sectors and the savings out of it. Straightforward. Equation four is just transferring on two sides. This side is a real economy. Uh, the left-hand side of equation four is a real economy. 
right hand side is the financial part of the economy okay up to this i mean this looks trivial but up to this just notice one thing i am only talking about flows i have not brought in stocks at all it i am only talking about flows it is very much like much of not quite but much of you know the keynesian tradition and so on it is the flow equilibrium which one is talking about in the saving industry now then enters a dragon and i introduce stocks this is the stock k is the stock of physical capital means of production valued by the firms and w is the and i just write equation 4 using these two stocks okay this gives me this is equation 5 and this is written as equation 6 where g it is just simple manipulation but its economics will become clear g is the rate of growth of the real sector small g capital g is the rate of growth of the final of the financial sector that is the growth of the output of the you know the new output of the financial sector or new shares valued the new financial products sold sorry not new shares, new financial products sold to the value of wealth existing at the moment so you have say multiplied by a term v which is in the equation one now the best way to at least i think the best way to understand this equation it is taking me a long time and i am not sure i if now i understand it fully but it is and just like it is like the trade between two countries one country which is producing physical goods the and the other country which is producing financial goods and think of the trade between the two if the trade between the two i would not have time to spend more but i can give you detailed examples if the trade between the two sides are balanced that is if the current account is balanced you don't need the capital account and the capital account is one the two financial v is equal to 1 tobin's q is 1 tobin's 1969 paper introduction on which he worked that you basically have the two flows e equal and the stock the market values the capital market values the capital exactly in the same way as the uh, capital market values in the same way as the firms value it and they share the profit on the basis of that valuation but if that is not the case then adjustment of stocks in the financial market takes place in other words you have secondary market which comes into play and this is the peculiarity of financial market because like as soon as the price changes it is not only the price of new uh, financial products that change they will also set in motion of all the stocks of the other at the same time it is like a second hand market gets adjusted to the change in the price of the primary market now so if v is not equal to 1 you basically have now you look at equation 6 suppose the right hand side is greater okay it is a positive quantity i'm sorry the left hand side is a positive quantity which means the rate of growth or profit per unit of capital you know the investment per unit of capital i by k rate of growth minus the profit uh, savings per unit of capital valued in by the accountants of the firm k if if this is positive then that side has to be positive that is excess savings here has to be made by excess investment here has to be made by excess savings there i remember this discussion long ago godly caldor all these people when i was also in cambridge and i think it was one of the most confused discussions i remember about what does the i mean everybody was confused i of course was totally confused but i think they all were confused 
the basically what was being discussed was what happens if you have a current account surplus what happens if you have a capital account surplus if you see many years ago well, Gordon was doing the accounting he said he got into accounting in a big way he and uh, Francis Cripps who was also my friend they got into a accounting in a big way precisely because of that reason because how is it that if what they were beginning to say in Chicago at that time that if the capital account changes on its own the current account changes why because the accounting shows it must change so how does it happen I mean you know what is the mechanism and so on that was being discussed if you look at here you see a kind of resonance of that argument if you have excess demand on the left hand side if this is positive if this is not being made by excess savings on the left hand side within the bracketed term okay by the financial sector then what you must have is the price of stocks must change v must adjust in such a way exactly like the capital account must adjust in such a way so the role that capital account plays in international trade v plays or what i call the plays in equation 6 here so okay now if i can get to the next one okay after you have up to equation 6 rest is manipulation it's not necessary 7 is just defining v like this provided that denominator is not zero and if the two are equal uh, if the two growth rates are if if the v has to be constant naturally the logarithmic differentiation requires that the two growth rates has to be equal that is equation 8 now using equation 8 i get equation 9 okay this is a simple dynamic story which i get that how v changes is a quadratic form where i use 8 and i use the saving investment equality in other words what equation 9 is showing you is something more it is showing assuming flow adjustment is not taking place that is saving investment equality is you know uh, for whatever the entire adjustment is being done by the stocks by the change in the price of shares or v okay this is equation nine rest is trivial you we need not waste time if you plot this diagram you get a diagram like this and this diagram has if you look at it the origin is unstable because v is increasing on this side v is you know on this side it's negative it's going away so this is unstable that point is stable okay so you have to have to stability requires it p1 should be here stability should come here i mean that that is a stable equilibrium this is not a stable equilibrium it's unstable okay Does the existence uh, forget it? This is only for people who make models. Okay. Now, the interesting point of yeah, the interesting point about this diagram is that it has a connection with traditional growth theory, and which actually first got me interested and Raghav who is also in the audience that you see it is like Solo's misinterpretation if I might use the word which I think is really accurate misinterpretation of Harrod that is you see Harrod's problem was saving investment equality how does it how is it maintained and so on Solo assumed that saving in Solo and Swan in the same year 1956 assumed that saving investment equality is maintained and assuming saving investment equality is maintained, how the stocks to the capital labor ratio adjust to reach a certain equilibrium. You remember that, that 
which is a generic neoclassical model. This is exactly the same here. I do not say anything about you know, how the growth rate changes or why the growth rate changes, why the sale. I just assume that given somehow that these bracketed terms are constant, you have an adjustment in the stocks and it is in that way it resembles the typical generic neoclassical growth model and which of course for the same reason is incomplete to put it mildly it is incomplete because it does not say about the flow adjustment saving investment equality okay i don't need it anymore okay now the separation of investment from savings decisions is incorporated by explicitly an investment function the so-called what is called the Keynesian, post-Keynesian, people go to town about it and this is, and I introduce it in a very simple form, only notice that it is the simplest form which has no constant term because of the fact that if both are zero, I assume that no growth takes place. But also this gives me the property of, it is a special case of a homogeneous production function, of a homogeneous function of degree one, okay. Uh, corresponding to constant unit, it is the same one. It has a homogeneity of degree one. It's a linear function. Okay. Now, this is actually, now what I have done, the rest is algebra. And I will tell you, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I want to discuss. Having done this, I will show you something about the algebra and so on because the algebra is really quite quite elegant, the, I mean, not my algebra, but the, essentially the catastrophe algebra is quite nice. The, but basically what I want to show is when you introduce an investment function, up to now I have not said anything about what determines R and what determines rho. You remember in business cycle theory, classical business cycle theory, endogenous business cycle theory, Caldor, Goodwin, Kalecki, in that uh, Samuelson, Hicks, in various ways you have a feedback between two. Income cause, investment causes income multiplier and investment cause, um, income causes investment which is in some form the accelerator. And this interaction gives you the whole so-called Keynesian models of, or endogenous models of business cycle. Here, I use this image at the back of my mind to try to find what could give a crisis in the simplest possible way, explain the crisis in a plausible sense. And you have the same kind of <coughs> feedback which takes place because as you saw in that earlier equation, here that basically you have V that is the adjustment in the financial market, stock adjustment in the financial market or the stock price plays the role of the capital account in international trade and this gives you a bond, you know, this gives you the stability, instability, etc. Similarly here you have I created, I mean, I experimented with, that is why I said the mathematics is less important because you can do it in very many different ways. Sometimes it produces crisis, sometimes it does not. I will come in a minute. But basically, I want a feedback between V and these two. That is when the share price changes, the share price change has an effect but on the real rate of, real rate of profit in the production and it has an impact on the rate of pro on the rate of return on the rate of profit in the capital market and this is actually one form of showing equation 13 here i have taken the simplest form it does not work. i'll show you why it doesn't work i have taken the simplest form where as share prices go up the real sector suffers rate of return in the real sector suffers, inverse related, but the financial sector 
positively related, uh, positive, you know, <coughs> and therefore it does well. So if you pro produce equation, if you take something like equation 13, do it, do the manipulations and so on, you basically get a cubic equation of this kind. Well, you know, cubic equations, well, fifth degree, as was proved long ago in the 19th century, is unsolvable for various reasons. But third degree equations are third degree torture. I mean, they are simply so cumbersome to work with, you know, if you really go by traditional algebra. And this gives you a taste of what you have to do to manipulate and so on. I have manipulated in the process. I relearned some of my school algebra and did this. And if you do this, you basically get an equation like this. You can reduce it to an equation like what is 16. Now this is the classic, this can be the classic catastrophe equation. The so-called catastrophe equation. What is the classic catastrophe equation? Which basically says it is a cubic equation. The diagram will come in a minute. It says that it is a basic uh, cubic equation which Rene Tom was, uh, and I think much too much was claimed for it like with all these new, with uh, what do you call it, chaos, catastrophe theory, when they discovered fractal analysis, when first this kind of new algebra comes in, I mean the little bit we at the margin begin to understand, it first looks very impressive and then you begin to see that it really has something to do with the old algebra and you can bring it back to fairly simple, if not high school, college algebra. So originally catastrophe theory was shown in this form that if you think of a, you know, three dimensional case, like for example, the, this, there is a thing here, an equation like this, 16, can fold like this, this is the topology, if you can think, fold like this and then goes back like this. So it has a fold here, there is one unstable here, there is stable here. This is what the equation gives, but then I began to, I did not, I mean, I don't understand three-dimensional diagrams very well, and I certainly don't understand topology. So I tried to reduce in a form in which I could really see it, and then I took advantage of some books, which are not books on catastrophe. Yeah. You see, if you take an equation like this and you break it up into two parts, I'll just simply tell you how it is done. You break it up into two parts, if you don't mind. One part is only this, a cubic equation without the constant term. The other part is a constant term. You take out this part. You plot these two equations, okay? That is how to reduce it to school algebra. You plot these two equations and see where they intersect. Whether they intersect, how many times they intersect and so on. This will give you the number of roots. Okay? You don't have to do anything higher. And this is exactly what we do. And then I later check with somebody who is a professor at MIT, I mean, who, does, who is a mathematics professor at MIT, and I think we are on the right track that you basically, this is, one equation is this, cubic equation like this, where the constant term is not there, and the other is the constant term, okay? You see how many times it intersects, and you immediately find that there is a, depending on n positive, negative, there is a, it can have one intersection, and in between these two extremes it can have three intersections. That is what is a very interesting case of bifurcation. Catastrophe is now nothing but a special case of bifurcation where uh, the situation goes from one real root to three real roots. I also constructed a model, which I will not show here, where you can have real, a quadratic equation, you have two real roots, 
two real roots, in between their imaginary roots. And this means that essentially you have a jump. Because after all, what are you trying to explain? You are trying to explain something which is not there in traditional mathematics, not there in Newton's idea of the universe and the, you know, and the, no, the classical mechanics which was used. That is, in that classical mechanics, small causes produce small effects and you have a notion of limit, so on and so forth, through which derivative and so on comes, or ratio reduced to a derivative, all this comes. But this is small causes produce a small effect. The basic change which has come, and which is really worth understanding, is that there are cases where small causes can produce big effects, abrupt change. And that is another name for catastrophe, that is another name for bifurcation. At least I think that is a sufficiently good way of understanding the whole thing. So you get this, and in between you get and this is I don't have to okay. This is what, thanks to Raghava, I, very recently I saw, that basically when it has intersection of this sort, what do you get when you have three points? Here, it cuts here, it's a stable point. Here, it's an unstable point. Here, again, it's a stable point. It's a typical thing, there are two stable points with an in-between unstable point. And this diagram, now again going back to a sort of my notion of topology, which is not really it. If you rotate the diagram a little bit like this, 90 degrees, clockwise, yeah, clockwise. If you rotate the diagram a little bit this wise, you get what is You get a diagram like this. The stable points I showed you for a whole range of cutting in between. You have stable points here, stable equilibrium here. You have unstable equilibrium here. In between, you have unstable equilibrium here, the, which is shown by red. Okay. And this is typically what happens in a situation like this. Now, I was happy, I thought, you know, in the simplest case I had solved the problem until my co-author, who is a great one for finding faults in what I do, <laughs> the, he pointed out that, you see, sir, he was one of my former students, he pointed out, sir, he rang me up late at night to say, sir, I have found that, yes, you have a fault here, but share price becomes negative. I would not show you the share price becomes negative and this very simple specification would not do. The simple specification would be give you a simple model where it does not work. So I started working. The model remains the same, but I had to introduce a constant term, you know, share prices fall. It is essentially the same, same model, but I had to fix it after seeing that share prices do not fall to the negative. It's a math, you know, so that it does not look silly and somebody later does not point out that the share price is to, And that's it. Now, what do we get out of models like this? Why? Is it just a game? Well, at one level, yes. I mean, I get fun <laughs> out of doing it and therefore I do it and I now live in a small town all alone, I have not, not much else to do. I, am, I don't meet very much people. So I can think out everything entirely the way I feel, I understand and I want other people to see. But I think it does give a message which is more useful than that. That you see, even in this very simple framework, which is essentially a Keynesian framework extended to it, introduce financial products or securitization of various sorts and further on derivatives and so on to introduce financial products 
even if you put it in a very simple form, you get something where abrupt change from small change in share price is possible. It is not necessarily that it will always happen. But what it requires is something which is really important. I don't want to use the word policy, but it is something which is regulators and so on can probably take a clue from. And that is when you see share prices are affecting rate of return in the real and rate of return in the financial sector, you should take it into account. It can happen in two ways. It can happen through what Minsky used to write a lot about and rather in a very verbose, I think in many ways confused way, that which is basically, it is not the Tobin's V, v is equal to one, not everybody is valuing the capital market and the real firms are not valuing shares in the same way. It's not a perfect competition model. It happens because you have capital gains and losses. It will have accounting problem. I know because capital gains of some is capital losses of others. And that is why how in national income you will deal it is another matter. But even without capital gains and losses, if you assume for whatever reason, and the reason I think I know mathematically also, the reason is whenever there are two groups in the same market, the bulls and bears, I would not do the mathematics in the same market, very close to of equal strength. Now I'm not using the algebra because I have not still worked it out fully. If you want, anybody is interested in seeing it is here. The, if they're close to equal, similar strength, within a certain range, close to similar strength, you can have a good case for catastrophe. A good case for abrupt change from a very abrupt large change from an abrupt large fall in price of shares in the capital market from a very small change in any suddenly, you know, uh, share price changes a little bit and therefore the profits of the two sectors change and this will lead to the next suddenly a big drop in share prices which is completely unexpected. Thank you. I think the, I would break up the problem to give an answer into two parts. I think the interest, you can hear, no? The interest in the problem, my interest in the problem arose precisely because the, this huge growth of the financial market and all kinds of, you know, over the counter derivatives and so on, we just assume phenomenal proportions. So obviously something was going on which in terms of finance and in terms of asset liability structure, one can explain and does explain in different ways. But basically, this is what makes the problem relevant today. That having a macro model which includes, allows for that kind of finance to come in, okay? About the absolute size of the financial market, it does not, I mean, strictly speaking, you can see because of the implied algebra, it does not matter very much because you see everything has been taken as ratio, rate of growth, rate of profit. It is per unit of capital, per unit of wealth. Share price is the ratio of the two values and so on. So it has been neutralized. Even the investment function has been neutralized to get rid of size. But I suppose if you have, if you don't assume that kind of homogeneity of degree one throughout, 
sizes will certainly matter. And in my case, even there the sizes came, began to matter because what looked like mathematically to any mathematician which would look like a completely innocuous term, you just add a constant or take away a constant and so on. That destroys the homogeneity and that makes it very important and that is one of the, what shall I say, hints I have that how to introduce, I mean how to comment on size. Well, thank you for a, uh, for a very stimulating lecture. I must say, I've, I've, this is a, a tremendously important, but I had difficulty following some of it. So Can you maybe either speak or I will come to say? Maybe, maybe um, um, some of my questions are better addressed afterwards, so that you can set a bit technical, some of them. But, but, but one simple question is, when you looked at your dynamic equation for the um, uh, well, just capital ratio, then uh, you assumed to make that one dimensional, you're assuming that your two growth rates are constant. But they're not constant. They are changing over time, which yes. means that. They are changing over time. But that means you don't have a one dimensional system, but at least a three dimensional no. system. No, 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 no. Just look at it, it is much simpler. Your V. Uh -huh. So the ratio of the uh -huh. uh, W by K is the two growth rates. Rate of change of V is two growth rates, right? The proportional change in V. I use that information, that equation, that this is how V changes to fit in the saving investment equality to get the equation. But you have as parameters in your diagram, you had a, a capital G and a lowercase g, and you treated that. Yes, there no, were the parameters. Just see. One g I have eliminated. The small g I have eliminated. <laughs> you, had, you had a g in there, one of them. Maybe, I maybe had only one g. I, for two g's, okay. I eliminated one. So you're assuming that that is constant over time? No, no, no. I, you see, I'm just replacing it by another constant, which is V dot by V. You see, V dot by V, by logarithmic differentiation, is big G minus small g. So I take out small g, I put in V dot by V in that place. So it becomes, and that I feed back into the saving investment equality. So V is changing, continuously V is changing along the diagram, and it, only at the equilibrium point it becomes stationary. Okay, let me, I think I'd like to, to discuss this with you after. I have another question that is more sort of uh, conceptual. Your, your capital G, which, which you, you, I mean, was the growth rate of wealth, you define that as the ratio of F to W. But F, if I understood your income accounting, was basically the value added, the sum of wages and profits in the financial sector. Is that right? Well, look, V, yes. I'm laughing Why because when Steve Margulies so was on the same page. We're on the same page. Yeah. We had this conversation. Yeah. We had this conversation, and okay. I think we are not convinced either of us. <laughs> <laughs> you see, just think of V, I mean, just think of F. What I said, just think of F as the new flow of financial products. Suppose 10 new securities have been brought into the, they're all of the same type. 10 new securities have been, the market has accepted 10 new securities. They have been sold 10 new securities, okay? Now these 10 new securities is what? Now you tell me, this 10 new securities is the value of sales of the financial sector? <laughs> but equity jumps in value. I mean, you're, you're talking about wealth, you're talking about the valuation. You're not, you're not talking, and, and selling those securities is not the same as the wages and profits of the financial sector. May I have a question? Yeah. I have a question, but I've seen this. Okay. Your key assumption is that W dot, 
time rate of change of w is equal to f. Yes. We don't agree with those dynamics at all, but that's, that's not the dynamics of wealth, uh, of capital's wealth. We, we print the securities, but that isn't how much wealth changes. If you, I, this is not the dynamics of, of asset markets. This is not the dynamics of the asset market. If you begin the revaluation of the stocks, is that what you are saying? Of the secondary market. You see, you have all. I just know. I, I'm not sure I understand. What you're saying. Okay, let us. I mean, you see, either that is exactly why I started by saying the full national income accounting must either show this to be correct or not show this to be false. I mean, what I am saying. I mean, I am I'm sticking my neck out, but without, partly because I have spent 20 years exactly what I presented, you know, in various ways I have been, from the time I started with Joseph Steindl on, you know, the, so maybe I am wrong, but let's, let's take it out later. I think, but I take the point, Steve made the same point. Uh, so, a uh, very, interesting, very interesting, and I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. So, maybe this question will bang into that question. But um, you said that you, uh, I'm trying to understand, so V is uh, wealth over the capital stock. Yes. Uh, and wealth is, but wealth is a, is a stock, is that right? Yes. Okay. So, it, when your uh, co author called you up in the middle of the night and said, can't, when, you, when your co-author called you up in the middle of the night and said, you, you know, you can't be zero, uh, negative. Why is that? In a financial economy, can't you have uh, uh, debt that's greater than wealth? Can't you have a bankruptcy? Why can't it be negative? You probably can. The model doesn't accommodate it at the moment. But you had to go jump through hoops to, to uh, prevent a negative. Be. And I'm saying that should be part of the model. I think about it. It is my instinctive reaction was well leave out negative quantities. Not in my <laughs> <laughs> negative quantities in my head. Yeah, maybe you were right. Maybe you, uh, not negative wealth, negative wealth ratio. Negative wealth per unit of capital by the yeah. K if K is positive it K becomes negative positive. wealth, yes. Yeah. It becomes negative wealth, well, yeah. But he says that. Well, Lehman Brothers found out. Yes. But you're not defining the as net worth. I mean, if it is net No, 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 no. Well, net worth can become negative, but if it is just the value of assets, it can only be fallen to zero. Well, well, why don't you define it as, as net worth? I mean, liabilities and, and debt are a key part of the financial. No, there are liabilities within the sectors. I mean, the way I was doing the accounting, but I still I think about it. I mean, as I said, I have spent many years on this, and many, most of the questions are still. But I think, you know, something like this, not because I'm doing this, something like this has to be done, just like business cycle with the financial sector, which is which goes beyond, you know, portfolio choice and which goes beyond Q and, you know, I think he wanted to. Yeah, I would like to go back to each time, by the way, each time I go through your, your exposition on this, I think I don't know the more, but still I don't understand more than, let us say, 50, 60%. But I'm very happy about having uh, learned so much. But if we go back to, to equation six, you, you use the analogy uh, between two countries, but of course, the way I had thought about it was uh, a trade between the financial sector and the real sector. Yes. Yeah, within an economy, of course. And, uh, and, and, uh, but it's better you think of two countries. Yeah, we can well think about two countries. And, and then the current balance will be balanced through, uh, uh, through in theory, uh, uh, by the exchange rate. 
and we change that kind of course from the, the theorem that will not happen. But my question is that uh, in general, in reality, the exchange rate does not produce an equilibrium uh, in, in the, the current economics. So why doesn't it do that? that it's there, but the V will do it here. That but the V is not, you see, this is exactly the, V is not the exchange rate. V is not a relative price in that sense. In the sense but because the analogy is not quite correct either. The analogy is not quite correct. No. But the analogy basically is to show that the capital account yeah. of international trade, which can be an adjusting variable. You yeah. know, that's why I was saying yeah. that yeah. the confusion between Godly, Caldor, Pasineti and so on, that yeah. discussion. Yeah. You have a similar counterpart here where you can go either from the capital account V changing and therefore the current account will have to change. That is the flow, the two flows have to adjust. Or the two flows change and therefore V has to change. It can go both ways. And, and my second question is, uh, if you have the because, I have no defense. But, but you can hear my suggestion. Uh, I would believe that real investment really depends on, on the price of shares. So that when the, the, the price of shares generally goes up, that would affect real investment. And in your model, it doesn't. Really it does? It does. G is a, yeah? That is the. Rune, for once, not knowing you are actually agreeing with me rather than criticizing me. <laughs> so is that a direct Well, you see, what I did was I said investment G depends on the two rates of pro two rates of profit of the real sector and the financial sector, but the rates of profit themselves are influenced by V. So indirectly, it becomes a function of that. Well, I mean, who knows? I mean, you can start with directly. You can start with. Yeah, you could say that. I, I accept it. You have a good explanation. So uh, I was thinking about your view, and it seems to be very similar to what uh, Marx called fictitious. I did have the idea, in, the if you see an earlier draft, I used the term. So it is, this is precisely what Marx called fictitious capital, which is the ratio of the book value of capital and the market capitalization. <coughs> that's right. So that's an interesting angle to But you see, if you say it, half of the people will get put off. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't buy it. But I know, I know, in, actually, if you see the Bundes, the volume three and the volume and the no and the notes when he talks about it is exactly he talks about this uh, you know fictitious capital actually i used it in the very first draft and then i took it out because i wanted a wider audience to read it so that will also solve the problem why we cannot negative because we, the capital is just the market valuation of the capital stock it is not network so it cannot be negative so that's why you don't write that in the of if you interpret this as fictitious. Yeah, but you see that is not in that is not I mean not necessarily what Marx said is correct. I so mean this is I think this is one <laughs> this is one way of representing it. And what's his name? Uh, animal spirit. Yeah, so how do you incorporate? How do you change that? But uh, so how do you incorporate yeah. this? That was a very disappointing book. It is nothing. Yeah. <laughs> no, I wasn't thinking that. Uh, but how do you um, in, how do you incorporate that into this? The well, in a very. I think that is. 
it's algebraically higher and incorporated is very simple. <coughs> I mean, it can be made more complex, but it, If you look at equation 13, okay, what does it say? It says that what you were saying with the, but one particular case where the V goes up, the share price, what I call goes up, valuation goes up, it has a negative impact on the real sector, unambiguous. And similarly, it has a positive impact on the financial sector because I was making the simplest model to see what happens and it produces negative value of V when I do the full catastrophe and so on. Now, if you add a term, suppose you say the exact algebra is if you say, for example, K1 V, a positive element, plus K2 by V. That is, you have this term, plus you have a positive term, okay? This exerts a negative influence, bearish influence, the positive term gives a bullish influence. And if you add superposition principle, if you add the, if you assume them to be additive, how, I will come in a minute, if you assume them to be positive, I mean if you add these two terms, you get a bullish effect and a bearish effect in the same way. You can do it for both sectors by introducing another term of this sort. Now, this is what goes back to what Bob Pollitt was asking, that you see how much bullish and how much bearish effect there would be. Depends not in the size of the financial market as such, but how much, how the market is divided between the two. Keynes of treaties on money, you know, the, you remember the, you know, the disgruntled, what, well, whatever it is, the where he discusses at great length four different cases and so on and so forth. But basically what you have there is two types and when they're very close to one another, in the sense that the, their weights in the markets are very similar. I think the possibility of getting this kind of a drastic jump leap down, or what would you call it, you know, is much more than when they are wide apart. What's the intuition behind The intuition behind this is when the market is very close, is very, if this whole algebra turns out to be sufficiently general for very many cases and so on. I don't do simulation, I can't do simulation. So I do whatever I can do, I do analytically. The, you see, when the two groups of people are very close to one another in terms of strength, their market strength, you know, how much, the bears and the bulls, you seem to have the market becoming much more prone to a collapse. When the two groups of people are, you know, one group is decided, and you can see the common sense of this, when the market is overwhelmingly bullish, prices will continue to go up. When the market is overwhelmingly bearish, the market will, uh, will come down. That diagram, which I, S like diagram which I showed, as they become closer, you move along the surface here, before, along the surface before you drop. So you can imagine that it's kind of a dynamic process, right? As the group keeps going, people get worried that they You see, the problem with words and algebra is they don't mix exactly. I will tell you why. No, I don't mean it to, you know, yeah. put you down, but you know, this is my problem, not yours. You see, you can imagine a dynamic process, but you know, what is the biggest problem, mathematical problem which we face, is in traditional algebra, when I, when I ask people who do physics and this kind of mathematics and so on, one or two people I ask, you basically, who work in this kind of area, they always work with the straight line, you know the diagram which I showed, the straight line, the constant term <coughs> as independent of the cubic term, cubic equation. 
So you move one, you keep the other constant. When I construct these examples, the problem is the two are not independent of one another. You see, so actually what you have to, it is a much more, I mean, strictly speaking, if you say it in words, it's a much richer problem because both the curves shift at the same time, you know. Uh, while in, uh, when they do usual catastrophic theory and or usual bifurcation, they don't. Only the constant term shifts or only that one, one shifts, the other you, one equation you change, the other you don't change. Here, both shifts continuously. And therefore, you know, to say that you move, and the dynamics you can define provided you know which variable is moving with what. This I have not been able to separate out. And you know, I should tell you one thing. In the, originally this was, it is called the Journal of Mathematical Economics. We had an article by somebody who actually was probably after René Tong, who was the biggest catastrophic theorist, Zeeman. Zeeman published a paper, which I spent a lot of time trying to understand. I think I now more or less understand it, though I don't understand fully the way he uses the algebra. Anyway, the problem which Zeman was doing was he was actually modeling the, he also did a heartbeat model for doctors, you know, why the heart suddenly stops at itself. And he, Zeman's sole thing was to show that if you have people who speculate on the basis of level, like Friedman's speculators, when prices are high, you sell, when prices are low, you buy and so on and you stabilize the market. That kind of whom we call the chartists, who speculate on the level. Also in Keynes, I mean Keynes did not say that, but also in Keynes where people actually speculate on the level. Level is too high, level is too low and so on. And there are the short term speculators who speculate on the rate of change. Basically the capital gains. I think this is what the, the problem which they are mentioning and they are so dissatisfied and maybe right that what is the, what is W dot, <laughs> you know, that basically he showed this kind of, in this kind of a case, but this is a description of the stock market with these two types of traders. One speculating on the rate of change, and I'm putting it very simply, but this is the idea. And here I capture the same thing in terms of bullishness and bearishness, both speculate on level. But one group believes that the level is too high and it's going to come down. The other group believes the level is too low and it is going to come up. And when these two groups are very close to one another, they are heterogeneous in terms of their weights in the market, catastrophe is much more likely. Not only I cannot understand, uh, nobody can understand, you have to speak loud, louder. So when we have it in the module, the topic of the real sector world, does that keep the module incompatible with financialization of non-financial Maybe, I, I, I have not thought about it that way, but I think basically what I want to, wanted you to see is not this particular way of, obviously this is false. I mean, that particular equations which I'm writing, I mean, you know, I don't believe in it, you should not believe in it, that this is the, this is actually something with, with, with we can go and do ethnometrics. But I think what is really needed to understand is that the source of instability, which you want to capture, as I said, in business cycle, it is investment affecting income and income affecting investment this two-way process feedback creates business cycle. Here it is the disequilibrium in the, invest, the saving investment, the flow market, or the, you know, what I said, the saving investment in this general model. The disequilibrium there affects V. V in turn affects them. And this effect comes true what he was saying that V affecting the rate of profit of the two sectors. How it affects is less important. I, you know, I have made some assumption because I'm experimenting with to see what produces, and in not all cases you produce catastrophe. 
but in some cases, just like in all multiplier accelerator interaction, you don't produce business cycles. Only with certain values you produce business cycles. Similarly here. Which one? The two are the later ones of the earlier. This? If you move this down. Start from an equilibrium which is unique because you're okay. at where y2 equals n2 is uh, further down. OK. Start from such an equilibrium. Disturb both y2 equals n2 and y1 equals x cubed minus nx. I'm not understanding how you get displaced, how a small change in both those schedules will produce a large change in the equilibrium. If your equilibrium is unique, right? If you if we assume that I'm starting with an equilibrium, in which case you are already assuming that the real root is one. There is only one real root. Okay, in which case, actually, formally speaking, this is not what you get the big jump in. The, you get the jump when you start with three real roots. All right, how does it work then? Okay, so you, you start, start with, you start with the one, the one the lifting one of them a little bit up. No, so this start, down, the yeah, straight line. Right, right, uh -huh. right. Okay, now for two. You get a large change in equilibrium provided <coughs> you have reached a point like this, tangency um, point. Yes, if you're all, all, but that's, that's a singular point. If you're at any other equilibrium. No, it is not a singular point. Sure there are two real roots. Because you, it's only the unique combination of that particular y2 equals n2 and the y1 equals x3, x cubed minus nx. But if you start from any other yeah. equilibrium, I, I don't understand. This is what I am really trying to get at. You know, when I basically started by saying why I thought forecasting a catastrophe would be exaggerating the would be an exaggerated claim for this, what I have done up to nine. Now, because if you are in a tangency point like this, you have two roots which are equal, and you have a third root which is different. You have three real roots, okay? Now, if you go a little bit down further, these two disappears, you have only one root. You have jump. Absolutely, but, but only, uh, only if you are in a tangency. Yes. Only? The space uh, is, uh, is of measure zero in the possibility. That's right. But you see, that whole space in between allows you to have three, three points, right? And this is one whole region where you can be at any point, it would be a stable equilibrium. This is what the diagram is all about. But if you start at any other point except 
the tangency. Then a small change will not produce a big change. Yeah. That is exactly what catastrophe is all about. But you see, my problem, why I have not been able to, you see, if I could, this is what I have been trying to do with Shukra. That if I could characterize economically this point of tangency, I think it would be quite an interesting, important result. Because you can then say, then you can say that this is the condition for when this configuration holds, you have the possibility of a jump. Okay. No, no, no. Those, em no, no. Those empirical values basically comes from what? Those empirical values comes from the coefficients of the investment function, savings rate, etc., etc. Right? Now, if they are time dependent, because R is time dependent, then you see you are moving on a region. This is what I learned from Zeman. <laughs> you are moving in a region where actually you think of them as time-dependent parameters. So you are moving in a certain direction. Say, for example, what in normal terms you say stock prices are going up, or bullishness is going up, you know, that sort of thing. So you are moving along there, and you reach a point where the configuration of the tangency is more or less reached. Then you can say that I, I have a macroeconomic characterization where something big might happen from something small. That is, that is my target, but I have not achieved it. Thank you very much.